We live in a time when our idea of community is frayed, strained due to the, our busy lives, challenged by the political landscape, and competing responsibilities. Some of us believe that getting involved will not change anything, that being civically engaged will just lead to defeat and frustration. But what does it mean to feel empowered enough to take action on an issue of concern, to get involved in a cause bigger than ourselves? Fortunately, there are many people in our community who are doing something about the conditions in which we live. They are creative and dynamic individuals who are fighting for what is right and for better lives for everyone. This program will show you that one person can make a difference and that the power of one is within all of us. Welcome to the power of one. Jason, thanks for being here today. Oh, thanks it's for having great me. to have you. Um, I know you're from Atlanta originally, so that seems like a long way from Pasadena. How did you manage to land here? Okay, so I went to uh, college for Chicago, uh, went to Chicago for college, and uh, my best friend from high school had moved out to go to college here in, in LA, I went to Pomona. Oh. And so I would come out and visit him on spring breaks, and yeah. I'd be like, wow, this is, this is nice. Especially after a winter in Chicago, you know, you mm. come out for spring break, and it was just like heaven. So. Yeah, yeah, and the five, they have the five colleges out there, and they do right. activities together, and so. I'm like, yeah, this isn't college. This is Club Med, you know. It's yeah, like, yeah, so. it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty risky in a lot of ways. So, um, then, what were you doing before you became a teacher? Well, so I'm actually not a teacher. I mean, I'm a volunteer. Then we should um, talk about that a little more. How does? Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, well, so. Yeah, I just I'm a I guess you'd say just I'm a volunteer parent. You know, I uh, my wife and I, um, you know, got involved helping coach uh, fourth grade math field day team, and and uh, sort of continued on from there. So, um, but uh, before that, I guess if that's yeah. what you want to get into. Yeah, that. let's let's do that first. Yeah. So, um, you know, my my profession is a I guess you'd say my trade is a software development. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, you know, out of college, I was working doing research and development in the derivatives trading industry, and then I, mm. I guess, but even nine months into that, I realized that that was not going to work for me, and that I, I needed to start my own company. So I started to raise a little bit of money. Well, actually, I should say, I took out a loan, bought a computer, wrote a prototype, raised a little money, got a buddy of mine from college to, to kind of agree to team up with me, and, uh, and then we, we got started. So it was about a year, almost exactly a year after I graduated, college, graduated we moved out to Pasadena. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for years my, my career was, you know, as I guess a serial entrepreneur doing various startups and it mm -hmm. was um, mostly related to finance. So I was, you know, what you might call the high frequency trading world. Oh. Yeah. So I did a lot of that and then, um, but that, that sort of segued into doing more web development yeah. at times. So. so that's very reliant on your math skills. And right. Yeah, and, and, and one of the reasons why that's relevant is thinking about um, as you're helping kids as a volunteer, which I misinterpreted, I thought you were a teacher, right? Um, is to be thinking about what sorts of professions they could go into. I mean, what are you right. preparing them to do, in essence? Especially right. because a lot of people think that math is pretty much a um, useless sort of a tool these days because you have calculators and computers that can do all those functions. Right, right. So what is a... Well, what is the value of, of what you're doing with these kids in the long term? What, what do they have to look forward to? Well, so I view math, math as like sort of like a gating function you know, to all these other things that you might want to do. When you say gating, you mean you got to get through entree? it. Oh, you okay. got to get, I mean, if you don't know math, none of this is open to you. It's not a possibility. So all of the, you know, the machine learning, artificial intelligence stuff that I was doing with the high frequency trading, not gonna, not doors closed, mm -hmm. can't do it. Can't be a trader, can't be in finance, can't be in Wall Street or anything like it. Um, you wanna be in Silicon Valley, you know, you wanna be writing code, you wanna be creating a startup mm -hmm. that's gonna change the world in some way. Chances are you need to know math just to get the kind of expertise mm -hmm. in these other areas to be even impact that. I mean, there are sort of other roles in that world as designers and things like that, but um, you know, all, all, all of those things require math to just be part of the conversation, just to get into mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and some other careers as well, like construction, mm -hmm. uh, engineering, there's mm -hmm. no way that you can be competitive at all. No. Um, so I think about it as optionality. Right. I'm trying to increase the optionality more. for these kids. Say, look, you know, 
even if you're not making decisions, you're making decisions. You know, it's like, you know, if, if you're not doing competitive gymnastics and you're 12 years old, you've opted not to be an Olymp Olympic gymnast, right? It's just, yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you, if you do or don't do certain things, you're, you're making choices. And so I, I, I'm trying to keep a whole lot of doors open for these kids. They don't know what they want to do um, when they're 12, 13, even 16, 17. Um, and, you know, it's not that later in life you can't switch directions. There's a lot of people who have second and third acts and they mm. retool and they do different things. But oftentimes it's hard. Um, and it's much easier if you figure things out earlier, at least get the, the sort of uh, foundational um, education that you need. Yeah. Yeah. But also by your logic, if you didn't have math, if you were trying to retool yourself and mm -hmm. recraft yourself, especially in a technological age, yeah. it would be more difficult. Yeah, you, you'd be limited as far as what you were going to do. Math is one of those things that like, you, you just better learn it when you're young. It's like language, yeah. you know? I mean, can somebody at the age of 40 just go ahead and learn Chinese or, you know, I mean, or Japanese? I mean, yeah, it doesn't happen very often. It takes an incredible amount of dedication and work. Yeah. Um, and the same with math. It, it, you might as well learn it when you're 10, 12, 15, 20, not, you know, when you're 35. I think the number of people that, you, that have gone from knowing zero math or just your basic level to learning advanced math mm -hmm. in their 30s and 40s is, is, is minuscule. Yeah, so let's get into something a little more controversial, mm -hmm. okay. and that is um, that people hate math. Okay. And so how do you deal with, and I, I'm just thinking about it from not, I, I actually like math and mm -hmm. I liked, I was never very good at it, mm -hmm. but that's the other part. So how do you deal with kids who are thinking, one, that I don't really like it, but then two, I'm not very good at it. Um, how do you build their confidence? Okay, so well, there's a couple things. I, you know, I think the I'm not good at math or I don't like math is sort of overplayed. I mean, it's nice for a headline and people like to say, oh, I was never very good at math, but you know, people love Sudoku and they love you know, you know, all these different games that are fundamentally mathematical in nature and logical in nature. And people get a great thrill of lining things up and figuring out their way through things. And it's, it feels good. You know, when you yeah. solve a problem and it works, you're like, nice, that worked, that worked. You know, but it's when the stress of grades mm. on top of things, I think that makes things unfun. You know, if, if, you know, because the problem is with math is you're either right or you're wrong for the most part. You know, and if you're wrong and a grade is associated with it, it feels really bad. You know, you can kind of BS your way through some of the other subjects. You know, you kind of parrot things back the way the teacher is expecting it or the way it was said in the book and partial credit and you're just like, ah, you don't feel so bad, right? But mm -hmm. the other problem I think with math, which is, is interesting, is math, being good at math is sort of associated with intelligence, right? When they show a genius, yeah. what do they show? Blackboard with equations. Yeah. Right? That's a genius, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're not good at math, you're therefore not intelligent, right? Mm -hmm. And so people want to just get away from that because they're like, you know, it, it feels really bad to think, gee, I'm, I'm not smart, I'm not intelligent, because mm -hmm. that is very closely, to, closely associated with people's self-worth. If I'm not smart, then I'm yeah, not Yeah, what a, value am I? Right. What good am I? So there's all this pressure and, mm -hmm. and self-identity things are built into it. So then how do, you, how do you craft the math academy in a way that emphasizes more um, success mm -hmm. and then um, less of that, you know, if you make a mistake or if you fail, that there's um, negative consequences or there's damage to the ego. So, uh, first of all, I, I should say we kind of stack the deck in our favor, which means... <laughs> well, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, if you want to go and, and have a successful soccer team, you go get the kids who are athletic and oh. really like soccer. You know, it's like, okay, or you want to have a really good, uh, you know, uh, band. You get all the kids who are musical and want to practice music. And yeah. It's sort of, you know, it'd be really hard if you got all the people who hate music and then it's like try and convince them all that they actually have a musical ear and they could play music. You could see yeah. how that could be problematic. So we have, we stack the deck. You know, we, we, we get the kids who have it or, 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 and like it, some combination, yeah. right? Um, Already have an interest in math Yeah, you know, to I, a certain extent. I mean, I think that like anyone can do math just like anyone can play the piano and every, anyone can play basketball. Yeah. But there's always a range in terms of like how easy it is for some people. Some people it's more challenging, some people it's easier, some, you know, somewhere in between. Um, so that makes it easy. That's, the second part is we get way ahead of the grade level stuff, so the kids feel really good about that. I mean, they're doing, they're learning math that their older brothers and sisters haven't learned yet. And yeah. so, you know, if you're that far ahead and you stumble, I mean, you're still way ahead of everybody else. I mean, what you do, what you're doing is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in 
sixth grade and you're doing 10th grade math and you get a C plus on a test or something or the equivalent, it's like, I mean, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. You know? um, so I kind of, I kind of, I kind of tell them like, look, I'm not worried about grades so much because like the worst you can almost, I would, if I was grading it, the worst I'd give you is a B plus, right? Like yeah. we're, I mean, you're already above average. Yeah. I mean, what am I going to tell an 11 year old because they, they screwed up some trig problems that they're going to get a C. I mean, that would just ridiculous, right? Yeah. I might give a B plus cause like, you know, you're not really trying, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. like you should. So, so I have a kind of a process question is how do you, so for these are kids who are already inclined toward math and maybe yeah. have a foundation, but how do you build it up so quickly from, because my understanding is they're kind of at an algebraic level, yeah. but then to jump them within a year to geometry, trigonometry, mm -hmm. pre-calculus, then even into calculus, how does that happen so quickly? Um, okay, so one, I try, I really try and lean towards what's efficient. Um, I've done a lot of research on cognitive science um, and what cognitive science has to say about learning and memory. Um, what's interesting is, and what's sort of depressing is a lot of the findings and what's well known in cognitive science is not applied in education, K through 12 or even in college. So everybody's doing all these things that just, you know, without taking consideration about how the brain even works. So if you can use some of these things, you can sort of like super accelerate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's probably like, I don't know, half dozen or more of these sort of, I don't know, I call them hacks. That when you add them all together, it's, you know, the sum is greater than the whole, or you know, the sum of the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts thing. You know, it's like, it's way more, of a, it's way more efficient and way more right. effective than, you, than you'd expect. So for instance, one example is, um, brains, our brains follow what's called an Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. So you learn a new concept, a new word, a new uh, math technique. It starts to fade the next day, the next week. It goes down eventually to zero mm -hmm. if you don't reinforce it. Um, well, it turns out that the best time to reinforce is not, not to just do it like you know, every day for three days in a row and then stop or, you know, or something like that. It's, it's to do it right before you're about to forget it. So today, tomorrow, a week, three weeks, three months, because hmm. you're ultimately trying to transfer this to long-term memory. Right, right, so it sticks. Yeah, so, and it turns out mass practice doesn't work. So if, if you do- You mean repetition? Yeah, so if you do 50 factoring problems, and yeah. I do three, and we've just learned it for the first time, uh, a month down the road, is, you're not gonna be able to determine who did 50 and who did three. So your 47 factoring problems is a total waste of your time. In fact, it had the side effect of sort of overdosing. Like now you're burnt out, right. you're bored, it wasted time. Yeah. You know. And you're um, annoyed. Because and you're annoyed. You it's had like, this, to do that. This sucks. Like, why am I doing this? You know. Yeah. So, um, in, in by following this, not only are, are we doing a much better job of getting this stuff in your long-term memory, so then you can access it and use it mm -hmm. to solve problems. But um, I leave a lot more time open to, to do more because I don't do 50 factoring problems, you get assigned maybe four mm. for your homework. So your homework assignment might be, you know, four problems from this, four from that, three, two, one. It's just mm. a kind of a mixed collection of things. And so is there a consistency between human beings as far as that um, mechanism for um, retention? Um, so there, are there deviations related to socioeconomic status or gender or, Ge geography or race or is but it who's capable of doing it? Yes. Well, first of all, our brains all work the same. I mean, effectively, I mean, everybody has a that's what I would, curve. Yeah. That's what I would guess. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen anything in terms of like gender or race. You know, I, I mean, all I can say from my own personal experience, I mean, you know, in some classes, well, actually, most of my classes, the girls are kind of dominant, <laughs> but we have a salt mall sample, you know, we have, yeah. you know, the boys, I mean, they're all amazing, right? But um, it's, uh, you know, and we have crossed the spectrum racially and everybody's doing well. I mean, there are kids of each race who are going to be good at math, mediocre at math, and bad at math, and just naturally. I mean, everybody, like I said, everybody can learn it. It just kind of requires, it's just ba about how much effort it's going to take to get there, mm -hmm. you know? So the reason for the question is to be thinking about um, sort of scaling up what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if what you're doing is extremely effective, which it appears as though it is, mm -hmm. I did see a video recently right. of uh, a contest at Caltech, I think it was, and, and Caltech professors being rather impressed with 
uh, some of the calculations that the kids were um, undertaking. Yeah. So if, if your strategies are across the board effective, socioeconomically, gender, um, ethnically, mm -hmm. then um, how might they then be applied in a broader context throughout either a school district or multiple school districts? Yeah, well, you know, one thing I'd like to just point out too in that video you saw of, that, of our competition, yeah. the, the two finalists in the seventh grade competition mm -hmm. who were doing uh, advanced calculus problems, integrals and differential equations, were both uh, lat Latina or lat Latino, Latina, and both lower socioeconomic. They both had to get, you know, fee waivers yeah. for the to take the AP calculus exam. Oh, they qualified. Yeah, and uh, you know, so they were in the finals. The uh, the girl who won the seventh grade is half Mexican, half African American. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> they're the breaking the stereotypes that people have in their mind, and right. they're amazing. I mean, they're, they're really, so um, the, the evidence is that none of that stuff matters. Yeah. And like I said, I don't really care what you look like or where you come from. You, either you want to do the math or you don't, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so in terms of how does this scale, yeah. honestly, I think that the learning techniques that, that we're applying, the, the, that are all based on cognitive science, can be, can be used for any age group, any subject. Right. Um, it's it's sort of tragic that this stuff isn't being applied, um, because it's like, like if I told you like you know you're driving to work and it takes you 45 minutes and I say you know there's you could do this in 10 15, minutes and you're yeah. like I'm like do you want to do 10 or do 45 you know and most people are like well this is how I do it I'm like okay well it's just a waste of your time you know um, I mean I, I think like the ultimate is sort of like you know we think of the movie The Matrix where they just plug something in your brain and it's like you immediately know something <laughs> right right okay. you download it download it so that's the yeah. ultimate okay so we're uh, here that's, that's yeah. the ultimate how do we get as close to that as possible you know how do we make it as efficient and painless mm -hmm. as possible um, right now we don't know how to do that but we do have a lot of hacks that get you from here to maybe here um, so how can we learn four years of math in one year you know that's a huge improvement um, so um, yeah I mean I think what we're what we're doing is sort of formalizing a lot of these techniques. I mean, a lot of this stuff is like, hey, I, I read you know these papers and, and these from these cognitive science journals, and I go, okay, I think we can do this or that, and I experiment with it, and it works. Mm -hmm. So now it's really about describing it, formalizing it, and I think maybe um, and it's just sort of maybe marketing it. Say, hey, look, here's something mm -hmm. that's worth trying. I mean, we're applying for for various grants, which I think ultimately could lead towards maybe a, um, a, a partnership with one of the nearby universities and saying, look. Mm -hmm. These things are, 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 are working in our um, context, but mm -hmm. we think they could work together. And I'm thinking about it more on a societal level. Um, with the, the challenges that we have before us, whether it's um, climate change, mm -hmm. whether it's um, water provision, mm -hmm. whether it's thinking about um, you know, um, traveling out into space, you know, all those are mathematical, mm -hmm. as you were describing mm -hmm. earlier. So we need to have people who can solve those problems. Right. And um, so I'm not even wanting necessarily a seventh grader to be able to do differential equations, which I right. think is fabulous. Right. I want um, a greater amount of our kids to be able to be uh, excited about math, um, good at math, and able to apply it into their lives. So if you have mechanisms by which or methodology by which those things can happen and it can be scaled, I think that's a huge benefit for all of us. Yeah. So what are some of, from your perspectives, what are some of the challenges that we face that are gonna need math in the future to be dealt with? Well, you know, you, you kind of set me up perfectly because it's sort of my, um, the, the big idea, which is this, okay. so it's like, I, I think fundamentally the world moves forward through advances in science and technology. Yeah. Um, so. But that doesn't just happen naturally. It happens as a result of really bright people who, who spend a lot of time educating themselves, working really hard, and then maybe we get lucky and we make advances. Um, so if we had 10 times the number of people like that working on these problems, we'd m most likely solve more Statistically. problems. Statistically. Yeah, I mean, you just have. So we have one Elon Musk. What if we had 10 Elon Musks? Yeah. I mean, the guys already have like five companies that are sending us to Mars and transforming our economy right. and to our transportation. Yeah, Tesla. Account. I mean, yeah, it's just amazing. So, you know, there are other characteristics about someone like Elon Musk, you know, as entrepreneurial and risk taking and vision or things like that. You, know, you can't, it, those might be hard to sort of manufacture. But what you can do is have increased the probability 
that you're going to find someone like that by vastly increasing the pool of people who have advanced degrees mm -hmm. in math and science. So if you're going to solve problems in energy or, um, I don't know, uh, yeah. health or whatever, you're going to have to have a, 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 probably an undergraduate or advanced degree in, in some kind of hard science, mm -hmm. right? So if you want a hard science entrepreneur, you need a hard science education. Well, guess what? You're not going to get a hard science education unless you have a really strong mathematical foundation. Yeah. It's just. There's been a lot. There's, I just read a paper the other day. It was talking about this huge fall off in um, STEM majors, something like a 40% reduction over the last 10 or 15 years of of kids taking these classes. And the reason is they don't have the mathematical foundation. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the mathematics, you just can't pass the physics course, the electronic engineering course, the genetics course. You just you can't do it. And, and so. Yeah. And that's that's why. I, and um, maybe I harp on this too much, but that's why I think that they have to like it. Yeah. That, that it has to be enjoyable, fun, that they have to have some sort of um, excitement and then recompense for that effort because otherwise it's drudgery yeah. or, or it's, um, it's, it's just a heavy part of their, their lives that they don't want to pursue. And, and then the other um, implication is, and I think that uh, places like Microsoft and a lot of Silicon Valley have experienced this, is that there's kind of a, a brain uh, drain sort of an effect here in the United States where we're um, importing folks from other countries and kudos to them uh, but it's because we don't have enough people who are capable um, in math in particular but then in also some of the other technological areas or sciences. Yeah I mean I think I think if you're really strong at math the, the not that the science isn't challenging but it's it's much clearer right yeah. I mean science is written in the language of math Right, so if, you, if you're fluent in math, it just kind of falls into place. Um, but if you're not, then it's almost impossible to see, see through it. Um, so, but in terms of the fun, that's a key component mm. for us. So I for I, the math academy. Yeah. So I, I, you know, when I tell my other instructors, I'm like, look, mm. there are two objectives that we have to hit. They have mm. the kids have to master the math, and they have to love it. If we fail at either one of those, we fail. Right. Mm. I mean, if a kid is great at math but hates it, what was the point? They're going to quit. Mm. And vice versa, if they had a great time, but they didn't learn the math, like, okay, what do we, this summer camp, I guess, you know. So um, we do lots of things to make, thing, to make it fun, you know. And then, and, uh, for instance, you know, I tend to have a lot of competitions um, where they'll all get up on the whiteboard and, you know, like to keep track of, you know, who's winning and losing. And I'll, I'll put up problems. I'll say, all right, here's the problem, and they all solve it. And mm -hmm. if they all get it right, then the slowest person gets a strike. And, you know, and I, I let them team up because they like to be in teams, you know, so, but the, the, they just love it. And so a lot of times I'll let that drive things because if I have to constantly tell them, guys, be quiet, listen, let me explain th something. First of all, it's frustrating for me, but it's a clear indication that they're not enjoying themselves. Yeah. But, you know, so I try and, I try and do things where I don't have to do that because I don't want to be frustrated telling them to stop talking mm -hmm. and I'd rather have them just naturally excited. So, you know, doing things in terms of games make that mm -hmm. work. And so they, they love it. In fact, you know, the seventh graders, we, we were doing these after school practice sessions to get them ready for the AP calculus exam. And they love doing it. Even they're like, oh, we doing it on Thursday? We doing it on Monday? I mean, I have to say, I, I, I sort of spiked it with, you know, pizza on Thursdays and ice cream on Mondays. So, you know, I'm not above bribery. Right, right. <laughs> well, but that they, adds to the environment. Yeah, but they, but, you know, being there with their friends, you know, competing and teasing each other and collaborating and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. it just, it's just, it's just fun, you know? And when we had this end of year competition at Caltech, you know, the other in instructor said to me, he's like, this is amazing because it's like we encapsulated a lot of the, what makes say watching a tennis tournament fun, but it's math, which is more fun than say hitting a ball back, going back and forth, you know? I mean, yeah. it, it, it's more interesting, right? It's right. It, it, the process of solving a tricky math problem was more interesting than hitting a ball, but then you had all the like, you know, brackets and qualifying heats and timing yeah. and made, you know, all the things that make sort of a competition fun. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the, the point is, we work really hard to make things fun because I know that if it's not fun, we're just gonna lose the kids and it's just gonna be yeah. a waste. So I know you're in either four or five schools now, um, or four and maybe five classes or something like that. Yeah, so we were, so. last year we started off with fifth and sixth grades, in mm -hmm. addition to my seventh graders, which is sort of like the prototype that we're building around. Mm -hmm. um, but we stopped doing the fifth grades just because there are too many elementary schools. So if like you just pick, yeah. if you have 18 elementary schools, you can just pick two 
and those kids get super accelerated, how do the other kids who feed on same middle school catch up? I mean, or how how do you how do you find enough instructors to blanket eighteen? Well, that's what I was talking about the scalability. Doesn't. Yeah. But you have seven middle schools, so now you have a little more of a choke point. You know, we get all the eighteen elementaries. So we picked three to start. I, we may just stay at three. We could go three to four, but if you have three options for middle school and you have a kid who's really good at math and science and say, look, you want to be part of this program, right? Because if you're not in this program, you're not even in the game. Mm -hmm. And so then they can, they, but they have three middle schools to pick from. And I, what our hope is that by having those three options, we can get, say, 85, 90% of the, of the kids who I think would, the program would be a fit for. And rather than going to all seven, in which case our cost is that much higher. Instead of having yeah. three instructors, now we have to have five or six, and so it's a much more expensive. No, I think that's a really good strategy is to be focusing specifically on the middle schools instead of trying to do all the fifth and sixth. Yeah, I mean, we, we initially started doing that because we started our our, our group, this, the, 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 uh, that sort of prototype group, when they were in fifth grade, and so we were kind of sort of pattern matching off that. But then once we realized that starting with the sixth graders that we I mean, in August, we're te I'm teaching the kids how to add and subtract negative numbers. I mean, that's, we are literally ground zero. Mm. They could not subtract five from three. Although, they... Well, they well, but that's what I was talking about, the accelerated learning. Yeah. It's incredible that you go, because you aren't, you aren't taking, my understanding is you are not taking kids who are at algebra level and above. You aren't taking trigonometry level students. You're taking basic math level students, right? Yeah, these kids are, you know, coming out of fifth grade, they have done common core fifth grade math. Which addition, means, subtraction, multiplication. They can add and subtract fractions. They may know what the Cartesian plane is. They can maybe do ratios. I mean, it's very limited. Um, so it's like, hey, okay, let's do, we're adding and subtracting negative numbers. We're, we're talking about like x plus 5 equals 8. What does x equal? I mean, we're starting, what's a variable? Yeah. I mean, that's where we're starting. Um, so, but by the end of, our, of this last year, we had the sixth grades um, of the 20 kids. Who, 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 uh, sixth graders who took what was called our, uh, the MDPT test, which is a, a University of California um, testing platform that they used to um, place kids coming as freshmen. Four of the 20 placed directly into calculus for engineering majors. Mm -hmm. So if you went to UC San Diego or UCLA, you'd go straight to real deal calculus. The next eight placed into calculus for life sciences, which is still serious calculus. Yeah, absolutely. 12 of the 20 into calculus and the remainder went into pre-calculus and that's after mm. nine months. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was, it was sort of amazing, which is mm. funny, and then you tease them about how I'm not knowing their negative numbers and they're like, oh, I knew my negative numbers. Right. I, can, I have uh, proof. <laughs> well, it's fantastic work and I'm so glad you could be on the show today and um, I guess what I'd like to ask you is if you'd consider coming back on some other time and we can go into more details. I'd love to. Thank you for That'd having me That would be great. On. This is wonderful. Thank uh, you. Thank you. And congratulations on all your great work. Oh, thank you so much. So we'll just keep talking and let them run okay. the credits.